Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Baptist Church in Greenville. It is our delight that you have chosen to worship with us today. Psalm 100 and verse 5 reminds us that the Lord is good and His loving kindness and His faithfulness never ends. And so it is our prayer today that you join in with us as we worship in song, as we share in the preaching of God's Word, that you hear the Word of God spoken to you. And most of all, that you respond as the Holy Spirit is calling you to. Thank you for being in worship with us today. Come, let us sing for the joy of the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving and extol Him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In His hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to Him. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God. Amen. We are so thankful that we get to gather on this Sunday morning and worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And what better way to begin our service of worship today than with baptism. This morning we have Abby Montgomery coming forward in Believer's Baptism. As Abby made public her profession of faith a few weeks ago and declared before our church that she has trusted in Jesus as her personal Lord and Savior and wants to make that decision public by following the biblical steps of baptism. And we are delighted to share this time in her life with her. And so, Abby, I ask you today, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, your personal risen Lord and Savior? Amen. Well, it is my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Our Father, we come before your throne of mercy and grace, and Lord, we thank you for this very important decision. Lord, we thank you for Abby and her family and Lord, uh, the faith that she is committed to walk in. Lord, we pray that as she's made this decision public, that, Lord, she would continue. You would bless her and you would, she would continue to walk in the steps of faith. And, Lord, for the great things that you would do in, through, in and through her life, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather and worship you today. Would you meet with us here? Would you be honored by the worship we give you? And, Lord, would you speak to us? Lord, we ask all of this in your holy name. Amen. It is indeed a great day to be in the house of the Lord today. We're going to sing all of our music today based on the theme, the deep, deep love of Jesus. We're so thankful that God loved us in spite of who we are, in spite of a sinner. It says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He knew we were going to be sinners, and he loved us anyway. Be thankful to him as we worship this morning. Let's start out by singing the good old hymn, Praise Him, Praise Him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer.
Amen. Isn't it good to declare the deep, deep love of Jesus? And that is why we gather together on this Sunday morning. Welcome to worship at First Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us today or watching online, I want to thank you for your attendance with us and for your presence with us here today. And we would love to know of your presence with us. And so if you would please fill out one of those visitor welcome cards in the pew back in front of you and drop that in the offering plate. We would love to connect with you this week. Uh, what a joy and honor it is to come together on Sunday mornings. Sometimes we can take it for granted. Sometimes we can just get in the habit and in the motion of do it, doing it. But let that not be the case today as we gather to remember the love of Jesus, the worth of his uh, power and might in our life, and the value of his word to us. We get today. We don't have to. We get to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and that is the highest honor of our life. Psalm 139 in verse 13 and 14 says, For you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, we thank you so much for the gift of life. Lord, for the gift of eternal life. Lord, what a testimony as we began our service today with baptism. We thank you for the witness of Abby sharing with the world her decision to put you first in her life. Lord, may we be reminded of that for each and every one of us. That every day we wake up, it's an opportunity to share with a watching world 
just what the psalmist said in Psalm 139, to remember that we are not our own, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You wove us together. Lord, our life and our being testifies to that. Lord, may our lips follow suit. Lord, may we worship you from the depths of our hearts, a song on our lips today. Lord, as your word is open, Holy Spirit, would you meet with us here? Convict us where we need conviction, but also encourage us where we need encouragement. Lord, this is your time. We're your people. May you have your way. And we ask all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
that's the name of our next song. Thank you for just another wonderful time in your presence, Lord, and I just pray that throughout this time and what has happened and what is to come, Lord, that we just continue to bring you honor and bring you glory. Lord, I pray that as we move into this time of offering, Lord, that we begin to think sacrificially, Lord, and just giving back to you um, to further your kingdom, Lord, to spread your will and to spread your love. And I pray that 
this sacrifice just moves into our lives, Lord, that it's not just here on Sunday morning when there's a plate in front of us, Lord, that we just live lives that are sacrifices to you, Lord, that are, we just strive to be like you, Lord, just serving others and showing your love and spreading your good news to each, to, to each corner of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to read a verse of scripture before the choir sings this morning to put the song in context. The song is called, I'm Trading My Sorrows for the Joy of the Lord. And the, the text is taken out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Listen to these words. They're wonderful. Now we have this treasure of grace in clay jars so that this extraordinary power uh, may be from God and not from us. We are pressured in every way but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. I'm going to skip a couple of verses and then read in 16. Therefore, we do not give up. And even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory you know we have the option to trade our sorrow and our pain and the hard things that come our way for the joy of the lord
Amen. Well, last week we began a series of messages that are going to take us through Father's Day, looking at the biblical priority of family and how family is God's very first ordination given here in the first three chapters of Genesis when God created Adam and Eve and he joined Adam and Eve together in the Garden of Eden and gave them the command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and they were to have authority over all of God's created order and to do that God's way. Of course, they overstepped God's command and God's obedience of all that God had given them to enjoy all the goodness. The one thing God said don't do, what well, they were drawn to and through the enticing of Satan, they overstepped that boundary and brought sin into the world. And you and I, all of humanity, have been sinners ever since. And so, we come to, to the text today, we come to the text throughout this series, and, and we want to see what does God's Word say to what has been distorted for so long. You see, Satan is at work today to destroy the family unit because he knows that it was God's original design. And he knows the love and the priority that God puts on the home and that God created Adam and Eve there. And uh, Satan could entice them to bring sin into the world, but he couldn't change God's mind, and he couldn't undo what God had already set in motion. Though he could bring evil, and he could make it harder, and he could distort it, he could not undo what God has done. But our world ever since has been under the lure of Satan, and, and Satan has been fighting against God's plan for, as we saw last week, godly mothers and godly women, godly wives, and as we're going to see throughout this uh, time together, godly parents and godly children, godly husbands, godly men, all of that that works together. He's been attacking us individually. He's been attacking the home, and we see the evidence of that all over the world today. But before we go any further in this uh, time together, we want to look today at what God's Word says about how God has created us in the gender that we have in the image of God. Now, I, I told our deacons earlier this morning, this is a message I thought I would never have to preach because it's so straightforward, so common sense maybe to us, but so such an attack on God's Word and godly principles in the world today. And we not only want to just stand against what the world is saying is okay, but we want to know why we know it's not okay and what we believe about it. And so this morning, we're going to see what Scripture has to say about you being created as a man in the image of God, or you being created as a woman in the image of God, and uh, how God has created us as we are with a plan and a purpose, and only God gets to decide. Anything else is sin if it contradicts what God's Word has said. So, what does God's Word have to say about our identity in Christ. Look with me beginning at verse 26 of Genesis chapter 1. And the word of God says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. What does this passage tell us about God's plan for gender identity, even in the world today? What does Scripture have to say about this topic? Well, first of all, we see that God's image is always the source. God's image is the source. The very image of God is the source. We have to begin with God. In fact, I want us to go back to chapter 1 and look at the very first verse of the Bible. In fact, the very first phrase of the Bible, and we need, no, need go no further. In Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, 
The Bible says, in the beginning, God. Now, I just want to stop right there and say, in the beginning, God. Now, we know that he goes on to say that God created the heavens and the earth. And and Genesis chapter 1 is going to be filled with all that God created until we get to the sixth day where God creates man and woman in his image. The only two beings created, the only thing in created order created in God's image was man and woman. And God created them and he said it was very good. And after God did that, he rested on the seventh day. But we go back to Genesis 1-1 because if you don't believe that, then nothing else in the Bible makes sense to you. If you don't believe Genesis 1-1, in the beginning there was God, and only God in the beginning, then there's no reason to go to the Gospels and read about Jesus. If you don't believe Genesis 1-1, then there's no reason to believe that Jesus was a good person. If you don't believe Genesis 1-1, then there's no reason to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin and rose from the dead to give you eternal life. If you don't believe Genesis 1-1, then there's no reason to, to, to take to heart all that we've been looking at almost the last year in Hebrews about the superiority and sufficiency of Jesus and his authority over the created world. If you don't believe Genesis 1-1, then there's no reason to believe Revelation and the fact that Jesus is coming back. In fact, I want to go a step further and say, if you don't believe Genesis 1-1, then there is no reason to believe that you have heaven waiting for you after you exit this life. You say, why do you say that? Well, I say that because all of that that I just said follows Genesis 1-1. If you don't believe Genesis 1-1, then there's no reason to believe everything else that follows it. But the contrary is also true. If you believe Genesis 1-1 and that there was a time in eternity past that nothing existed except God. Our human mind cannot comprehend that, and that's why God is God and we are not. You know, there has to be things about God that make God God and separate from everybody else. And our world today wants to make a rational sense of everything and understand everything, but let me just tell you, you will never understand God fully. You'll never understand what it's like to that, that God has existed forever in eternity past. And somewhere in that time, space and time, God decided to begin to create. And so in the beginning, God created. And if you believe that, if you believe that this universe was created, it didn't just happen, it was created by a master designer, then listen closely. You have to believe everything that follows that. If you believe Genesis 1-1 then you have to believe everything that follows that. You have to believe Genesis 3 with the fall. You have to believe Genesis chapter 2 where God create, he's created Adam and Eve and he joins them together in the very first marriage ceremony. And that marriage ceremony is between one man and one woman for life. If you believe Genesis 1-1, then you have to believe Genesis chapter 2. You have to believe Genesis chapter 3 where sin enters the world and And Satan, God didn't bring sin into the world. God uh, created us with a a limited ability of free will. And and, and Adam and Eve uh, chose to follow the the will of Satan, the will of man in in the heart of man, instead of obeying the word of God and brought sin into the world. You have to believe the Exodus story. You have to believe the prophets. You have to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. You have to believe that he lived a perfect, sinless life because that follows Genesis 1-1. You have to believe all the writings of Paul when Paul gives great, straightforward instruction to the church and calls us how to live. And what the Bible calls sin is really sin. And what the Bible says is righteousness is really righteousness. And that is only righteousness in Jesus Christ. And you have to believe Revelation. That soon and very soon, Jesus is coming back to take the church to where he is and anyone who does not belong to him will not just cease to exist because you are created in God's image. That follows Genesis 1-1, which part of being created in the image of God means you are created eternal. Now, you are not a part of eternity past because you are created. God created you. God is the only one who is a part of eternity past, but you are a part of eternity forward, meaning there was never a time that you Um, There was a time that you were not, but there will never again be a time that you are not. And those who do not believe the authority of Scripture and the power of the gospel will spend an eternity separated from God. 
And so Genesis 1-1 is our starting place. And so after we've nailed that and you say, yes, I believe that. I believe in the beginning God created. Well, then we have to take God's creation to heart. And we have to use that as our basis, our foundation of truth. If God truly did create, then listen closely. Only God is the source of life in the beginning. And everything that God created belongs to God, lives under the authority of God, submits to God, and will one day eternally submit to God if you believe Genesis 1-1 and I think most of us do and so that means we've got to take what God's word says as our standard today and not what the world says we've got to take what God's word says and not what we want God's word to say you know, most of our sin in life, most of the time we, we get mad at God or God's word simply because it calls out sin. And really what we're doing is we're not worshiping God. We're just, we're just creating a God in our own image who can agree with everything we want to do and everything we want to be okay in our life. But if God always agrees with you, then you're not serving the God of the universe. Because only he is perfect and righteous and holy. And we are not, but he's making us to be like he is. And so God came to a point in his creative activity that he wanted, he wanted to create the world. He wanted in that world, he wanted a human relationship to reflect his glory unlike the animals reflected his glory or the earth reflected his glory, in which they do very greatly. But you and I, we are to reflect God's glory much more than they and so Genesis 1, 26 says, God said, let us make man in our image. Well, who is the R there? It's, it's God. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who have been a part of the Godhead for all time and, and space and eternity, perfectly united. And the Bible says, uh, he didn't just say, let us make man in our image in the Hebrew. That word man uh, includes humanity. That's him saying, let us create human beings in our image because then we come down to verse 27 and in his image he creates them what male and female so God's image is the source of our being human life all of human life is created with dignity and worthy of respect in the image of God now we need to understand that very clearly Everybody that walks the face of the planet is created as God created them and wanted them to be in the image of God, worthy of dignity, worthy of respect. I read Psalm 139 at the beginning of our service where God uh, formed us together in our mother's womb. God creates life, and that's why we believe that we are to value and uphold that life because that life in the womb is worthy of dignity and respect all the way to the tomb. We've got to value life from the womb to the tomb. Because we're created in the image of God, and God gets to decide, God gets to define, and only God does. He's the source of life. And He created you in His image, and we messed it up, but He's working to restore us. When you're in heaven one day, you will be restored to the perfect image of God to live in His presence for all eternity. When sin enters the world in chapter 3, it messes everything up, but that does not change God's mind or God's standards. Our world today is preaching a different message. That if I don't like how I am, if I don't like who I am, I get to decide who I want to be. Friends, the word of God is very clear. God and only God is the source. And God and only God, because he is the source, one day we will stand before him and have to give an account. Nobody else. We will not stand before anybody else. So God is, God's image is the source, but also we see that God's plan is the standard. God's plan is the standard by which God is bringing this whole world back to. Look what he says in verse 27. God created man in his own image. God created human beings in his own image. In the, ima in, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God's plan is the standard. God created human beings unlike anything else in his creation in his image. He created them in his image with a plan, and he gave them a gender identity in that plan. He says, I'm going to create. He created Adam first. We know that if we go and we look at the more extended account of Adam's creation in chapter 2, which you can read all of Genesis 2. We won't read that for the sake of time today, but you know the story. God 
fashioned dust from the earth and he created Adam. And he saw that it was good. Adam was created in the image of God. But God looked at Adam and God said, uh, it's not good that man be alone. Because God wanted to create humanity for us to have a relationship with God in a, in a godly and human relationship. But God also said, uh, you know, I, I live in heaven. He lives on earth. And it's not good that man be alone on this earth to do all I've given him to do. And so God caused a sleep to come on Adam. And God took a rib from Adam's side and he formed it into a woman whom Adam would name Eve, for she is the mother of all living. And in the Hebrew text, the Hebrew word for man is the word ish. The, the Hebrew word for woman is isha. Very similar word, except it adds the feminine on the end of the masculine, because that's what God has done. God has created human beings in his image, a lot of like in their form and and appearance. They're very much the same in the fact that they're both human beings, but at the same time, they're very different. Created in God's image still, both, but a man and a woman. And God joined them together in the only relationship in all the world that God would ever say, Two individuals now become one. And that's God's plan for every godly marriage. You're no longer two, but you're one. And this was God's plan. It is the standard. It was the standard back then. It's been the standard all throughout the Bible. And let me tell you something. The world says marriage is outdated and godly marriage is certainly outdated, but it's still God's standard today. It's not. It's not. How we have drifted from God's standard today, but God created Adam and Eve to be united together as one, to be one, to complete each other in ways, to live in harmony and peace with each other. You can veer from God's standard all you want to, but one day, let me, let me be very clear, one day everything is working its way back to God's standard. This world has drifted far from God's original plan. And it's so chaotic and so messed up, we wonder how will we ever get back to what God says he wants it to be. Well, only God can do that. And outside of him, we will never get back to it. But God is bringing the whole world back to Jesus. I've told you before, but I love it so much because it's so true. Adrian Rogers used to say, people ask, what, is, what in the world is this world coming to? And he said, let me tell you, I know what it's coming to. It's coming to Jesus. Good or bad, the world's coming back to Jesus, and we'll have to give an account to him. And Genesis 1-1 will still matter. Genesis 1-27 will still matter. Genesis 2 will still matter. Even though Genesis 3 took place. You can veer from God's standard all you want to, but everything is coming back to God. God will judge based on his standard and nobody else's standard. God doesn't need somebody else there helping him judge the world. God will one day judge us all by his word, by how we lived by it, by how we trusted it, how we lived in faith with it, how, what we did with Jesus and how we walked with him, how we lived with him, and how seriously we took the word of God. And let me say, the world wants to tell you that when you uh, pattern your life after God's standard and when you live by God's standard, that somehow it restricts you and binds you and takes good things away from you. And I want to tell you, the Word of God does actually the opposite. The only freedom, the only peace, the only joy that you can find is if you submit your life and live by God's standard doesn't make sense when we're living in sin because when you're living in sin you think you're having everything the way you want it you're going along with the world you're getting life the way you want to but if Genesis 1 1 is true then we have to read Romans 1 what does Romans 1 say for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I must skip down some. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were darkened. What is Paul saying there? He's saying in their heart of hearts they knew that God was God, but they didn't believe Genesis 1-1. They didn't live by it. They professed to be wise by human standards and they became fools. I know a lot of people who think they're smarter than God. I don't know them personally. I know of them. You do too. 
think they're smarter than God. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and the birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women, exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in the desire towards one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, does our world acknowledge God any longer? We began taking God out of schools out of the workplaces, out of the public arena. God drifted out of the homes, and we don't acknowledge God any longer. The sad reality is we have many churches across this land that don't acknowledge God any longer. And so what happens? God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanders, haters of God. Insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Sound like the world today? And he ends in verse 32 and says, although they know the ordinance of God. Friends, most people know really in their heart of hearts and mind of minds that there has to be a master designer beyond all of this. That those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but they give hearty approval of those who practice them. And here we are. We know the lie. We know the truth. But we've settled for the lie because it makes us feel comfortable. It it meets our own sinful, selfish desires. And we not only practice those things, but now we applaud those things. And we are experiencing the wrath of God every day because of it. The wrath of God is being poured out. Basically, it's God saying, you want it? Here, have it. Until we meet our death. Now, the wrath of God ultimately is going to be poured out when Jesus comes back. And we read about that in Revelation. But Romans 1 is very clear. If we do not follow God's standard, then we live in God's wrath. But it's very clear. God's plan is the standard. But God's blessing is also the satisfaction. Verse 28. I'm not going to read all of it for the sake of time, but God blesses them and he says, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Basically, he's giving Adam and Eve the authority. He's giving humanity the authority to care for what God created. And he charges them to populate the earth. And and God created Adam and Eve in this way so that they could experience God's blessing. And they found joy there. The marriage relationship was joyful. It was without conflict before sin. And it was joyful to work the garden. It never worked against them. And and they experienced satisfaction because God's blessing was on them. And God has pronounced his blessing all throughout his word from the beginning to the end. But our world today takes the approach of Satan. The one, thing that God, the one thing that God said don't do, he let Adam and Eve focus on so that they would do it. And we have all of these things in the word of God that give us the blessing of God. But we as human beings in our sinful nature, we want to focus on the pattern of life, the things of life that we can't do or that the human flesh is drawn to. And we think those are the things that bring us blessing. When in reality, those are the things that bring us death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But when we live, when we walk with God, we live by God's standard, we obey, we honor God in our life, you will find blessing. You will have the peace of God. You will have the joy of God. You will be satisfied in your life and the plan that God has for you. Whatever that plan is, you find freedom, joy, purpose in living out that plan. And there's no way to find joy without it, ultimately. Let me say, you cannot claim God's blessing while contradicting his commands. 
Many people in the world today, they want to say their prayers and say, Father, bless me. God of heaven, bless me. While their life is full of sin. God's not going to bless a sinful life. The psalmist prayed for the Lord to remove any sin in his heart so that his prayers would be heard and so that he could experience the blessing of God. And somehow we've skipped that verse in the Bible and we act like we can just live however we want to. We can live our own standard. We can do our own thing. And and then we can just ask God to bless us when we need something in life or some big decision in life. God is not going to bring blessing when we live a life that contradicts his commands. But there is satisfaction in living under the blessing of God and submitting to the will of God. Lastly, God's word is a supreme judgment. We can move on down to verse 29. God continues to give them everything that's on the earth and Verse 31 says, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. We move on into Genesis chapter 2, and we get a full account of God's creation, especially of mankind. And then in chapter 3, we get the fall. And what we find in the fall is that Adam and Eve learned the hard way that what God said was true really was true. And I think our world today is wondering if what God's word says is true really is true. You know, Satan has no new ways to work. If we would just read the Bible, we would see that he's just putting maybe a new spin on his old ways, but he's still working the same old way he always has. And that is causing the world to question the very word of God. Did God really say? How many problems in our world today that Christians are struggling with that the church is having to answer morality issues, gender issues, marriage issues, life issues that the church is now forced to answer because our world is living a wayward way and really the, the schemer behind it all is Satan just really saying, it all comes down to this, did God really say? If God really loves you, would God restrict you from that? Absolutely he would. Because he loves you and he has something better for you. God's word, though, is always the standard of judgment. God never leaves his creation in the dark with anything. He could have. God didn't have to give us the Bible. He didn't have to give us Revelation. He didn't have to give us Genesis 1.1. God has not left us in the dark. And God's judgment is pronounced in his word, not because he wants to give his judgment, but because he's righteous. And let me tell you, under the judgment of God is not a place you want to be. I've already read Romans 1, that presently God's wrath is being poured out among sinners and the unrighteous. But Revelation tells us that God's judgment is coming to a great climax. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. And it may sound like a sci-fi story when you read it, but it's reality. Because Jesus is coming back, and I wouldn't be surprised if Jesus came back before the end of this day, because everything's set up for him to come back. And we as the church need to live like it. We need to live like we believe it. Under the judgment of God is not a place you want to be. Revelation says in those days the unbelievers will be fleeing to the hills, calling for the hills and the caves to fall on them and hide them from the presence of God. You can't hide from the presence of God or His judgment. God's Word is a supreme judgment. And we want to live in a place of freeing satisfaction, not a place of forging fire. Sin can be called by many different names. It can be called being tolerant. It can be called uh, uh, self-worth. It can be called living life, loving life, whatever you want to call it. You can disguise it because Satan is doing that. He's a master of disguise. But it all comes down to what does God's word say? And anything that opposes God's word is sin. As I was preparing this message and I was thinking about how simple God's design for humanity is, that in the beginning, God said something that really should make common sense to us. Is that when you're born, 
You're assigned an agenda, a gender before you're ever born. And when you're born, you're either a boy or a girl. Genesis 1 says that. God created a male and female. You don't get to decide that. The world can tell you that all day long, but we don't get to decide that. God has determined that. And I was thinking just about the simplicity of that and how crazy it is that our world has gone so far from that and lost all common sense because the world hates God so much. And what we as Christians are told is to keep our mouth shut and not talk about the Bible because the Bible contradicts what the world is living in. And we just need to be quiet so we don't hurt people's feelings. Well, there's somebody more important whose feelings I'm worried about hurting. And his name is God. And we live in a world that wants to be so tolerant and walk on eggshells because we might hurt somebody's feelings. How do you think God feels? How do you think God feels? Why do we get to leave him out of the equation? Genesis 1-1 says without him you wouldn't be here. Genesis 1-1 says those people that said that, that we need to, to, to worry about feelings, they wouldn't be here. In fact, the only reason that, they, that any of us get up and have breath in our lungs in the morning is because God allows it. So if we take God out of the equation, God can take us out of the equation like that. And I think it's past time in our world today that the church, yes, we're called to be loving. Jesus said, by your love, the world will know you belong to me. But let me tell you something. The most hateful thing you can do for a person is to let them live a lie. The most hateful thing you can do for a person is let them continue living a lie without introducing them to the truth. Now, you're not responsible for what they do for it, but without introducing them to the truth, sharing the truth with them, and praying that God would change their life before they meet the end of their destiny, which is if they continue in sin, and sin is defined by what God's Word says, if they continue in sin, then they're going to meet eternal death. There's no other way about it. The most loving thing you can do is to tell someone the truth and help them find the truth and friends Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father but only through me so if you believe Genesis 1 1 then everything that follows matters to you today so what will you stand for what will you stand for as a church we've got to be salt and light in a very dark world we can't be afraid of speaking what God's Word says because one day when we stand before God, this is going to be, this is going to be the source of judgment. And you will find blessing and you will find satisfaction if you pattern your life after it. Maybe you're here this morning and you're struggling with sin. You're living in sin. And you know God's Word is very clear. But God's word testifies to God's grace and God's mercy and God's love that if we give that up and come to him, there is not a person that he will reject. No matter what we've done, no matter what we've believed, doesn't matter how bad we've hurt his feelings or how bad we've treated God. If you repent, humbly submit to him, he will save you. And if that's you in this place or under the sound of my voice watching, then in just a moment as I close us in prayer, right where you are, right where you're doing, just get still, be quiet, and pray before the Lord that you know that you're a sinner, you know He's the way, the truth, and the life, and you want to give your life to follow Him. And in that moment, He will save you. For those of us that know we're children of God, what, what other things are we struggling with in life? Are we living in a pattern of sin? Are we failing to stand on the truth of God's word? Are we failing to be convictional Christians and live what we believe and not be afraid of sharing that with a lost world who desperately needs to hear it? May today be a day of courage for us to know if we're going to find God's blessing in the end, then we've got to live in God's conviction today. Father, thank you so much for... Your word, thank you for being very clear to us. 
Thank you for not leaving us in the dark. Lord, it's not always what we want to hear, but we know if we only always heard what we wanted to hear, then we would not be very far in life. Lord, you would not love us if you only told us what we wanted to hear. But Lord, you do love us, and so you point out right from wrong for us. And you show us the way everlasting. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today that needs salvation for the first time, that Lord, you would draw them and meet them there. And help them find that, find you. Lord, for others of us, whatever we're struggling with, whatever conviction or lack thereof we have, would you meet us here? Would you empower us with courage and conviction and lead us into this dark world, ready to stand for you and your word? Lord, we love you. And it's all and only in these things we, in your name we ask. Amen. I pray that God has spoken to your heart this morning as we've spent time in worship together. If the Lord has laid a specific decision on your heart, please notice the contact information there on your screen. Reach out to us, whether it's a first-time decision to follow Christ, a prayer request you have, or some other need in life. We are here to minister to you. Thank you again for being with us today, and we hope that you'll join us again next week.